Hello, everyone. Um, if you want to say where you're from in the chat, that would be pretty cool to find out where you're all coming from. Um, just make sure you've got it to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it's just me reading everything, which is um, fine for me. But I don't know how interesting it is for you. I've also got Annalise from Berlin. Hello, Poland. What else we got? Oh, Brazilian living in Berlin. That's pretty cool. I bet it's colder for you there. Um, Slovakia, someone from Dubai, Berlin, who's the furthest away I wonder, we're going on a few little travels with this talk today so that'll be fun, Ukrainian living in Berlin, oh Olga, hello, um, Chile, Italian living in the UK, Germany, Berlin, <laughs> Exeter, Berlin, shouldn't be that surprised, Heukelheim, it's cool, oh the Isle of Skye, that's pretty Pretty cool as well. And Cologne. Oh, hello. <laughs> Norway, Italy. Oh, Norway, you might know some of the stuff I'm going to talk about then. That's pretty fun. And Basel. Yeah, Heidelberg. Okay. Got anyone else? France. Oh, Spanish person living in Berlin as well. Obviously, lots of people in Berlin. It's a shame we couldn't all be there this year. Okay, I'm going to get started pretty quickly because um, that is an awful lot to get through in half an hour. Um, one of the things I want to do, though, we're going to do a little quiz at the end. So if you make sure, if you want to take part in the quiz, that you have either um, a pen, a piece of paper, or like your phone or something to just jot your answers down on. Because if you get all the answers right, you can get a little prizes. Um, so that would be useful if you make sure you've got that. Um, Ginny used to live in Berlin, miss it. I know. I wish. I really wish we were there this year. It was great last year, but shame we all have to stay inside now. Uh, in a lot of Italy. Oh, Costa Rica. That's cool. It's pretty far away. And um, the prize will be announced as we get to the quiz. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that there because we need to get through this. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen already. That one. Dogs. So let me just make sure I can see the chat. Oops, we've gone a little bit further than I went to. Ah, uh, we'll just go back here. Okay. And we got someone else from Berlin. Okay, we're going to get started because, yeah, like I said, got an awful lot to get through. Mm, yeah, Sorbian is not one of the languages I'm looking at today, but I'll explain why I've picked the ones I've picked um, for you in a second. So, um, just a quick introduction about me. My name is Charlotte. I'm from Utalk. I work at Utalk. Um, we make a language learning app that has 145 languages currently that you can learn. Um, and you learn through playing games, you learn how to speak and understand, and it's pretty cool. And because we have so many languages, one of the really fun things about it is that we get to look at more than just kind of world languages. We can look at minority, regional, indigenous languages in some detail. And so I wanted to look at some of the endangered languages you can find in Europe today, because I think that's something that we don't always really think about with Europe. There's obviously some really major languages here. Um, because we're going through it so quickly, because I really, really want to do that quiz at the end, I'm going to try and leave some time for questions, but I might not. But if you have something you want to ask me, then you can just email. My email is going to be visible the whole time up here, and it's going to be on the final um, slide at the end. So if you do have any questions throughout, you can write them in the chat and I'll try and answer as I go. But if I do miss them, just email me and I'll reply. So we're going to start by looking at the state of global languages, the ones that are endangered. So I've started this with just some numbers. Um, there are about six to 7,000 world languages and UNESCO, which is the organization that keeps an eye on languages and language endangerment, as well as other cultural things, has data on about 6,000 of these. And what they say is that 43% of these 6,000 languages are endangered, which is about 2,600 languages that are endangered. And in fact, linguists think that half of all the world's languages will die out within this century. So by the end of the century, they'll be dead and that one language dies every two weeks. So it's really, we're at a very 
um, crucial tipping point in terms of how many languages we're going to see within the next 100, 200 years. Um, UNESCO has five levels by which it measures if a language is endangered. So a language is safe if it's not at all endangered. So something like English is safe, German is safe, um, Mandarin Chinese is safe, Hindi is safe. So these are all safe languages. It's vulnerable if it's only spoken in certain domains. So a domain is an area. So if you only speak a language at home, for example, then it might be vulnerable to becoming endangered because if you're not using it at work, then you're not using it all the time. And that other language you use at work to make new contacts and things like that might overtake the language you use at home. Um, then we have definitely endangered, um, which is that children aren't learning the languages. Um, and that's an issue because if children stop learning, they don't pass it down to like later generations. Uh, severely endangered, which is that grandparents speak it, parents understand it, children don't speak it really at all. And critically endangered is the final one, which generally means that grandparents and older speak it, but no one else. Um, and that's a very, very difficult point because it means the language is probably going to die out very soon. Um, so this map here that you can see shows the 51 top endangered languages in terms of the ones that have the highest numbers of speakers worldwide. And so as you can see, there's a really big concentration in Europe. Um, in India as well, North and Northeast India particularly, and some in Peru, Belize, South America. You also notice there's this one here and this one here. These are both Yiddish and Yiddish is actually represented a few times on this map because of the Jewish diaspora. It means that it's spread all over the world. And so is the Romani language Romanes. It's represented um, a few times here in this little thing because they're for a traveling community. Um, what's the fifth level? So safe, vulnerable, definitely endangered, severely endangered, critically endangered and extinct, but that's not a level. Um, yeah, so the other numbers we have are 192. That's the number of endangered languages in the US. So only Yiddish is represented here because the endangered languages in the US tend to be indigenous languages and they have a very small number of speakers nowadays. And 196 is the number of endangered languages in India, which because it's got such a high population tends to have languages or has a few languages that have still very high number of speakers but it also has the most um, endangered languages in the world of any country. So we'll zoom in on Europe a little bit. Um, so a lot of these numbers are EU specific just because it was easier to find those numbers. Um, so they're not representative of all of Europe but we could find the ones for the EU. So UNESCO says the EU has 221 endangered languages um, obviously, there are 24 working languages of the EU, and then it, it also recognises as an organisation over 60 indigenous, regional and minority languages. But this doesn't always mean that those are different languages. What it can mean is something like German is recognised as a minority language in South Tyrol because it's spoken there. So it's just a minority within that region as opposed to being a minority language in some cases. The issue we have when it gets to endangered languages like this is that the st legal status of languages and the support they receive is entirely up to the national government where they're spoken. So this can cause problems because some national governments support languages more than others do. And you have languages that are endangered in some countries and not in others. Uh, 12 is the number of endangered languages, uh, European languages that we have on the UTOC app. And today we're looking at five of them. So if I start from the north here, we are looking at Southern Sami in Norway and Sweden. Then we're going to come down to Scotland and we're looking at Scots, not Scottish Gaelic, and we'll get into that a little bit. Then we're going to the tiny Isle of Man to look at Manx. Uh, then we're finally going to come down towards Spain and France to look at Basque in the Basque country, and then over to Sardinia to look at Sardinian. So we're going to get started on that. So we begin with Southern Sami. This language is spoken by around 600 Sami people in Norway and Sweden. It's a Uralic language, which means that it is more closely related to Finnish and Estonian than it is to Norwegian or Swedish, um, which is quite interesting because obviously they are closer by, but it's developed differently. It is uh, one of 10 Sami languages. And just for comparison, Southern Sami has 600 speakers, Northern Sami has 20,000 speakers. So there's a real difference in how well um, they've been preserved over time. However, good news for Southern Sami is that it is one of six Sami languages that has a written standard. So it's one of six that has 
an actual official way to write it down, which is really, really good news if you're trying to preserve a language and is probably why it is severely endangered instead of critically endangered, even though it only has 600 speakers. It's because if you have the written standard, for one, it gives the language prestige. So it means that speakers of the language take it more seriously because they can write it down and because they can prove to speakers of other languages that it, it's a real language. We can write it down, we can have books in it, we can use it on TV. It also makes it easier to teach. So it means that they can teach children how to speak it. And there are a couple of schools and kindergartens that do teach Southern Sami to Sami children. Um, the other thing we see for kids is this show, it's a TV show called Vina Banash, I think I'm saying it hopefully right, um, which has been dubbed into Southern Sami. So you can see it's got a cute little reindeer puppet that paints and sings songs and these subtitles here are actually in Norwegian because yeah it's all dubbed in Southern Sami so that the kids get used to hearing it and we know that if you hear something dubbed you're actually more likely to learn from it than if you are reading subtitles so if it was the other way around and the children already knew Norwegian they would probably learn a lot less and it's fun for them like you learn through being entertained you don't learn when something's hard. Um, the other thing you can do to sort of help preserve languages and um, like help to invigorize the community to preserve their language is to celebrate their ethnic heritage and their cultural heritage. So the 6th of February every year is Sami National Day um, and it's celebrated I think quite well in Norway and in Sweden um, and Sami people on this day are encouraged to fly their flag which happens a lot in Norway and to sing the Sami anthem in their local language so one of the 10 um, dialects of Sami or one of the 10 Sami languages. Um, and so, yeah, this is really important for them because if you celebrate someone's cultural heritage and their language, you're again, giving it legitimacy to prove it's a real language. Um, and the other thing about culture is it's important to preserve languages. I think a lot of people believe because of the way they tie into our culture. So our culture is intrinsically woven into our language. It's how people before us have developed um, the ideas they've thought of, the way they've seen the world. And it literally and figuratively does affect the way you see the world. So there are been plenty of studies to show that you literally if you can articulate something you view it in a different way and a really good example of this in Sami is their word for reindeer so the Sami people traditionally have been reindeer herders many of them still are today and I think in Norway or Sweden you have to be Sami to be a reindeer herder um, but I'm not 100% sure um, but reindeer have been part of everyday life for hundreds of thousands of years and you can see like this outfit this lady's wearing is probably made of reindeer fur, these shoes are probably made of reindeer hide, they eat reindeer and they they herd them like cattle. So it's not really surprising that the Sami word for reindeer, bovse, comes from the proto samoic word for cattle. Um, so because this is part of who they are, so it's like us, we have cows because we use cows for everything. So it's really important to preserve languages for those aspects as well, even if it doesn't seem relevant to everyone, it's relevant to them. So we're going to learn a little bit too. Um, I'm hoping you can hear this because I really don't want to have to try and pronounce them all, but let's see. So to say hello in Southern Sami, you would say... Hey. 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 Please let me know if you can't hear those because it's going to get real boring real fast. Um, and to say thank you, you would say... Gehtua. Gehtua. Gehtua, Gehtua. Thank you, Thorsten and Aditya, for that. Um, so, yeah, hey and Gehtua are hello and thank you. So, you can practice these a little bit, and you guys don't have to worry about anyone being able to hear you. I have you all listening to me. So, we'll take a trip down from Norway to Scotland. I want to say it's slightly warmer. I'm not sure that's true. So, um, Scots is the language we're looking at. It is spoken in Scotland, shockingly. Also Ireland, there's um, a dialect of Scots called Ulster Scots, so it is different that is spoken in Ulster, which is the northern part of the island of Ireland, um, kind of spoken there. And also some places in England like Corby and Kent, where there have traditionally been a lot of Scottish workers, so it's like the mining areas of Kent where they've had Scottish workers come down. About 1.5 million speakers, the reason it's a vulnerable language is because um, there's been some disagreement about whether it's a dialect or whether it's a language. I think most linguists agree now that it's a sister language of modern English, so kind of like some of the Scandinavian languages are where they, you can kind of understand them if you speak one, but there are differences, you couldn't pretend to be a speaker of one um, like natively. Um, but these 
issues of it being a dialect versus a language and then some of the other things that have happened have led to it being um, catalogued as a vulnerable language. It does have a very long literary tradition despite the fact it's never been standardised. So even now there's no standard way of writing Scots. You just have to try and write it how you think is correct. Um, even though there's people like Robert Burns is a famous Scottish writer and you'll see a little bit of his work in a minute. Um, there's J.M. Barry who wrote Peter Pan and uh, Robert Louis Stevenson who wrote um, Robinson Crusoe. Um, they both either wrote in Scots or wrote Scots into their dialogue. Um, and the novel Train Spotting was written in the an Edinburgh dialect of Scots that was highly anglicised, but it is Scots. So Heidi's asking what is meant by Scots. So it's not Scottish English or Scottish Ga Gaelic. That's what I'm saying. It's completely different in between language um, that is spoken in Scotland. So Scottish Gaelic is mainly spoken, was mainly spoken, and is still in the Highlands and the Northern Islands of Scotland. Scots was the Lowlands and still is. So kind of um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and up this way, I think towards Aberdeen. Um, and now Scottish Standard English is the English spoken in Scotland by all of these people, more or less. I don't know if there are any monoling monolingual Scottish Gaelic speakers anymore. Um, so it's been declining in status since the Act of the Union, which was 1707, when English started to be a real big influence. Um, but today is recognised as a minority language. So if we look at this as a spectrum and here's Scots and here's Scottish Standard English and English is way over here, um, then it's very difficult nowadays people are finding to try and work out where most people are speaking on this spectrum. So where is the point where it stops being where it's Scots inspired English or English inspired Scots? So it's quite difficult, but it is very different. Um, and if you were on the internet this August, you might have noticed a little something about Scots and Wikipedia. Um, oh, that's very bright. So um, there was an issue where people found that the Scots Wikipedia had had thousands and thousands of articles um, written and published by someone who not only was not a Scots native speaker, because that's not really a big deal, they weren't a Scots speaker at all. They were just writing English with a Scottish accent. And it means that there are now so many articles that people have to go through and try and correct. So the only thing we can really trust on this page is, are these labels that have probably been written by someone and verified as being correct by um, the Scots speaking community? And we can see it's quite easy to pass a lot of it. So following recent revelations, Scots Wikipedia is presently reviewing its articles for, and then we've got two words here that aren't really clear, inaccuracies. So it's a couple of words here that we don't know. So muckle lied. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but muckle, um, a lot of lied language. And then here, the Scots that was used in this article was written by a body that's mother tongue isn't a Scots. So the Scots written here was written by somebody whose um, native language mother tongue isn't Scots. So there's some, you can see a few differences, but because it's not been standardised, it's caused a real issue with um, also working on trying to correct all these issues because lots of people feel like they're not very confident writing Scots as opposed to the Scots that they speak every day. Um, are there currently any media in Scots in paper or electronic? I mean there's the Wikipedia but don't trust it for a little while <laughs> yet. Um, I think some of the Scottish newspapers occasionally do publish some articles in Scots. Um, I tried to go on the Scotsman but they don't actually seem to do it anymore. Um, but you can find a few around but again because it's got no written standard it's quite tricky to find them unless you're looking at some kind of older literature, I think, but I could be wrong. There could be an awful lot hiding somewhere, which is quite likely. Um, as for our Robert Burns, um, I think everyone, I think everyone knows him in Scotland. I think most people in the rest of the UK do know who Robert Burns is, if only for this. Um, so if you're an English speaker outside of the UK particularly, I'd love to know if you do this, but this is the song we sing at New Year. So as the clock strikes midnight, we sing Old Lang Syne. Only these two verses, because it's like the national anthem, we only know a little bit of it. Um, but this is actually the Scots version. So there are some differences to what we would sing in England. We do still sing um, Old Lang Syne because that's the name of it. Uh, we don't say my Joe, we say my love. And when I looked at the full lyrics, there are differences from the Scots and the English version. So it's not a one to one. And even I think in Scottish Standard English, it probably isn't a one-to-one -one with everyone if they don't speak a lot of Scots. Um, but yeah, basically it's just about remembering all your friends and wanting to see them again.
So we learn a little bit of Scots. The first one's going to be easy-ish. You can all practice your Scottish accents at home. Hello. Hello. So hello is just hello. So it's a bit like if I say hello in German, it's hello. It's very similar. Um, and then we have I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So don't is um, made dinner and ken is to know. Oh, Kapana is written. <laughs> written in a very um, dialecty version. That's very cool. And yeah, we've got some talking about Scottish English. So yeah, Scottish Standard English and Scottish English and Scots are totally separate languages. And Scottish Gaelic, again, is totally separate. And also Scottish Gaelic is from a different language family, so entirely different. Um, and Thomas put a really cool link in that everyone should check out at the end. So we're going to just come down from Scotland a little bit and go to the Isle of Man. So we're going to look at Manx, which is a Gaelic language like Scottish Gaelic. Um, it has around 1500 speakers today. And when I say it's like Scottish Gaelic, what I mean is it's an exactly the same branch of the Celtic language family tree. So we have on this side in the Britonic languages, um, Welsh, Cornish and Breton. And with the Goidelic languages, we have Manx, Scottish Gaelic and Irish. Um, and what happened was Manx originally was over here with Welsh. And then over time, it got so influenced by Old Irish because um, the Isle of Man is in between the UK and Ireland that it moved over to this Goidelic branch. Um, and it's been influenced by some other languages as well. However, from the Middle Ages, it really began to decline again because English just comes in and pushes everything out. Um, and also because contact with other Gaelic, uh, Gaelic speakers reduced, um, so people stopped speaking it. And by the late 18th century, nearly every school on the island was just teaching in English. So you had wealthier kids were going to um, England to go to university from the 17th century. Church services were being held in English. So things like that. I'll get to that in a second, Thomas, it's really cool. Um, and what happened was by 1874, a third of the island was speaking Manx. So it, dropped significantly. 100 years later, the last native speaker died. But in 1899, they already knew there were issues with the language's vitality. They knew it was going to go extinct eventually because English was just so, so prevalent. And it's such a small island that they knew it was going to take over. And what they did was they formed this organisation here, which is the Manx Language Society. And I would try and say that, but I can't find out how to pronounce it. Um, and what this did is it means that there was a lot of efforts made to um, sort of portray the language really well and work for it and fight for it. And it was recorded very, very well. And it meant it could be taught later on. So there are now Manx language schools on the island. There are kids that are learning Manx and speaking it all the time. And it meant that when UNESCO declared it extinct in 2009, they got to fight back and it was upgraded to being critically endangered. Which also gives us a little bit of a discrepancy with what we said before about UNESCO saying something's only critically endangered if um, it has grandparents speaking it, because I would think, I think most of the Manx speakers are children or a little bit older because they've still been learning it, but it's just because there's so few and they're not, they are native speakers, but they may not be classed by UNESCO. Um, Manx Gaelic has also influenced the English on the island, so we have a few words that are spoken in Anglo-Manx, which is the English spoken in on the Isle of Man from Manx Gaelic. Um, so we have skeet, which means news or gossip, but you can also use it to say to take a look. So in Anglo-Manx they would say take a skeet at something, take a look at something. Hop to na, which is the Manx Gaelic term for a Celtic festival, which seems to be Halloween, but I'm not 100% sure if it's a one-to-one -one Halloween thing. And then show slange, which is cheers, so it's like slange in Irish. Okay, so to say hello in Manx, you would say Le Mai. Le Mai. Le Mai. And please is Mesalj. 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 So Le Mai, Mesalj for your Manx there. Okay, and we're finally heading somewhere a little bit warmer. We're going down to the Basque country. So this is northern Spain and southwestern France. The Basque country stretches along it. Um, when we look at the total number of Basque speakers, 750,000 of them, 93% of them are in the Spanish part of the Basque country, 7% are in the French part of the Basque country. So it's really, really large in Spain. 
Um, the fun thing about Basque is it's a language isolate, so no other languages are related to it that we can find. It's also suspected to be pre-Indo-European and potentially the oldest language um, in Western Europe. So it's been around for ages and ages and ages. It's not related to anything else. We don't know where it's come from. It's really cool. Um, it has historically had five dialects and still has obviously different dialects, but was standardised in the late 1960s, which is super important, not only because we know if language is standardised, it will help it survive, also because this was Franco's Spain at this point, and they were really suppressing the language, so in some provinces you weren't supposed to speak it at all, it wasn't um, taught in schools, you couldn't give babies Basque names, all sorts of things. Um, so yeah um that's part of the issue there about 40 percent of basque words are borrowed from other romance languages anyway and we think some languages have been lent into other languages from basque but not 100 percent sure which ones because it's so old um it is a co-official language in the spanish part of the basque country but not in the french part of the basque country which does lead to some kind of issues for french citizens who also speak basque so I'm just going to speed this up because we are running out of time. Uh, to say hello in Basque, you would say... Kaisho. 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 And goodbye is... Agur. 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 So that's just a really quick one on Basque. And um, we'll go to Sardinian because I really want to do the quiz. Um, Sardinian is spoken on the island of Sardinia by 1,350,000 speakers. Um, it is the most conservative Romance language, which means it's the most closely related to Latin. It's about 8% different from Latin, as opposed to like Italian is 12% different from Latin and French is 44% different from Latin. Um, so to kind of a quick look here at um, all the different ways of saying these things. So I got these all from our app. Um, so for example, you can see Sardinian Latin really close here. Um, here is quite close. Carayas and Clave is very close. The only one that's different is the word for left, but that's just because even though these Italian languages obviously all took it from Latin, Sardinian took a different Latin word for to mean left. So sinister means um, something's bad or adverse or hostile. Manca comes from the Latin word for manco, uh, mancus, which means defective or imperfect. So it's still a similar meaning, they just took a different word um, for it, which is quite interesting. However, despite having all these speakers, so we can see that's significantly more speakers than Basque has, Sardinian is still more endangered than Basque. Um, less than 13% of children speak it, and 16.6% .6 of people um, only, use uh, only use Sardinian or um, some other languages in their home, so that's not even just Sardinian speakers, they sometimes these people who speak English or Spanish or Chinese. And when you're outside the home, it's only 5.2% of people are using Sardinian or other languages. So it's really, really not doing well there. It's partly because it's not represented in education and partly because it was recognised as a minority language so late. Um, and now it's starting to get this um, Sardinian influenced Italian spoken on the island, which native Sardinian speakers call Italiano Porcedino, uh, which means piggy Italian or broken Italian. So that's kind of what's happening there. So, say hello in Sardinian, you would say... Salude. 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 And to say what's this, you would say... It is custo. It is custo. It is custo. So, okay, we're going to do a quiz. So I hope you've got everything ready, because we've really got to rush through this quickly. Oh, it's getting darker and darker here as well, so hopefully you can still see me. Um, basically, I'm going to show you the question. Um, I'll read it, read the answers, and then give you a couple of seconds, and then we'll move on, because I've really got to rush through this, because we started a tiny bit late. So, um, how do you say hello in Southern Sami? Do you say hi, A, hi, B, halu, C, hey, or D, sal? So make sure you write these down um, for yourselves as well, because if you take a screenshot of this at the end, you can win some Ucoin, so you can use that app for free. So our answer for that one is C, hey. So loads of people got that right. Great job. Okay, what does the Scots phrase I don't know can mean? Is it A, I don't understand, B, I don't know, C, don't worry, or D, don't move? Okay, let's see how many of these come in. Oh, you're all doing pretty well. Okay, I'll give you five, four, three, two. It means, I don't know, B, I don't know. 
Okay, what level of endangered is Manx? Is it A, vulnerable, B, definitely endangered, C, severely endangered, or D, critically endangered? Okay, let's see. It's quite tricky to remember these, so no problem if you get this one wrong. Okay, three, two, one. It is critically endangered. Still, hopefully it'll get a little bit better. Okay, how do you say goodbye in Basque? Uh, is it A, agor, B, farewell, C, no, no, or D, adiosu? Oh, we got a lot of people who like Basque here, I think, looking at this. <laughs> okay, give you three, two, one. And yep, it's A Agor. And I think Heidi's noticed what I did there was um, the other three were Scots, uh, Southern Sami and Sardinian. So just so you know, goodbye in all of them now. And this one's an audio question. So what does this audio mean? It is custo. Is it A, what time is it? B, where are the toilets? C, what's this? Or D, how much does this cost? Coming in quick. Okay, give it three, two, one. It is what's this? It is custo. Means what's this? When you go to Sardinia, you can ask what stuff is. Okay, so that is it from me. I don't really have time for questions because yeah, we started a little bit late and gone way over. Um, but I've got a few links for you. So um, the top link is just our offer for Expo Lingua. So it's 50% off um, all of our subscriptions. So you can learn any of those languages. You can go and have a look on our website for that. Um, so that's uta.lk slash expolingua. Then the second one is uta.lk slash sign up. Um, we do a lot of events. We want to do some other stuff. If you sign up there with your email address, you'll get an email about that. That's all that's for. And then if you want my slides, um, I've got a link to a 15 question Kahoot quiz that's a bit longer and a write up of this whole presentation that goes into a lot more detail. Um, go to uta.lk slash expolingua dash extra. Thomas, which language are you asking if we teach? Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, email me as well at charlotte at utalk.com because you can't see behind me anymore because the sun's going down. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. I'm glad you're so interested. I'm sorry we had to rush, but there's just so much to talk about in these languages and not enough time to do it. Um, and yeah, thank you very much.